Some buildings in my neighborhood stay empty forever. Now I know why. Final. It took me nearly three hours to drive to Wyatt. Then 15 minutes to find the Black Curtain storefront that was the new home of Blacklight. It was stuck right in the middle of the only strip mall for miles. Nestled between a Mexican restaurant and a laundromat with a sun-bleached sign. Stacked like dominoes between a crumbing parking lot and round-topped, yellow hills. They called themselves the Church of St. Jude this time. I sat in my car for 10 minutes, summoning the courage to approach the nondescript door. When I finally willed myself to approach, I found the door unlocked. The Church of St. Jude was, unexpectedly, quite normal. If I hadn't known better I would have pegged it as a dental office. A small waiting area in front and a larger, open room behind it, connected by a doorway with no door and a large window in the wall between the rooms. There seemed to be a small office at the far end of the bigger room. There was a closed door and a corresponding, black curtained window. The large main room was, save for a messy stack of cardboard boxes, empty. Three folding chairs were set up haphazardly in the smaller waiting room, and a shelf jutted from the wall in front of the window, functioning as a reception desk with a boxy, old computer and a disconnected phone. A lone woman stood behind the reception desk staring at the computer with a bored expression on her face. She was, like the Church of St. Jude, intensely ordinary. Asian. About thirty, round-faced, black hair thrown back in a ponytail, dressed in a drab blue sweater. As I entered, she met my eyes with an empty expression. We're closed, she said plainly. I must have gaped at her like a fish. I'd had a three-hour drive with spotty radio reception to obsess over blacklight. Over the Reddit posts I'd read, over Louise's description of the cult-like ritual she'd witnessed a decade before. But, I realized as I faced the painfully average receptionist. I had forgotten to decide what I would actually say when I got there. Um, are you blacklight? I finally managed. The receptionist cocked her head. Never heard of it. We're the Church of St. Jude. Well, can I join your church? I ventured. Her expression didn't change. You'll have to come back when the parson is here. I took a couple steps towards her. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the black curtains of the small office at the far wall rustle and shift. I lowered my voice. You were in Los Angeles ten years ago. You were. Your church. Mid-city, around Koreatown. The receptionist smiled. I've never been there. It sounds nice. The curtains shifted again. The receptionist's focus was back on her computer screen. There was something about her I couldn't put my finger on. Something like the frantic energy of a scared squirrel, cloaked by her robotic speech and the forced staleness of her eyes. It is a nice neighborhood. I started. Then I tried something. There's a lot of fair people there. Her head shot back up. She stared intensely at me. I had her attention. There wasn't, for a while. I continued. But now they're coming back. The receptionist glanced over her shoulder. Towards the back office with the closed door. Then she turned back to me. I don't think we can help you. She said, with a tinge of sympathy. I think it would be better if you left. She looked over her shoulder again. The black curtains quivered. I began to think there was someone back there. Someone listening in on our conversation. Please. I cajoled. I don't want people to get. We can't help you. Please leave. I did what she said. Cursing the wasted hours of driving. I reclined in the driver's seat, pondering my next move. Well, I'd have to do just that. I thought. Move. Convince Jenna to forfeit the deposit. Pack our things and hightail it to the opposite end of the county, if not farther. There was a click, a rush of air. My passenger side door had been opened. The young Asian receptionist stood there, jaw set and trembling. What the? I stammered as she shimmered into the passenger seat. Quiet. I've got about ten seconds. She placed a small, black, triangular object on my dash. Bury it, she whispered. Bury it deep. Where do I? You know where. 
She hissed. She looked me in the eyes and, for the first time, I saw purpose in hers. The angels and demons fear the same thing. Rats flee a sinking ship. It will slow them, but nothing can stop him. And, with no further explanation for this bizarre and terrifying set of phrases, she opened the door, jumped out, and rushed back to the church of St. Jude. I arrived home three hours later, exhausted, frustrated, and anxious. As I entered my apartment, I saw Jenna standing at the fridge, her back to me. A small amount of relief numbed my aching muscles. I needed to talk to her to hear her voice, to unpack the load of pressure that had been laid on my shoulders. Jenna, thank God. I breathed. Jenna tensed to my voice. Without even bothering to shut the fridge door, she scampered across our living room, hands over her face, and into her room. She slammed the door. Utterly confused, I ran after her. I knocked. Jenna, what's going on? Where have you been? No answer. I turned the knob and pulled the door open an inch, before it was violently wrenched from my grasp and loudly slammed shut. Okay. She doesn't want to talk. I retreated to my own room. I sat on my bed and examined the hunk of stone the receptionist had given me. It was roughly the size of my palm. Surprisingly heavy, and so black it appeared to absorb light. I set it on my dresser and opened my laptop. I had a new email with a new attachment. Part 2 of Adrian's translation. Drip, drip, drip. Whatever was dripping the night before, it was back at it again. I ignored the rhythmic sound and opened the email. Millie, you ask, and I shall deliver. But in all seriousness, dude, where did you get this? It's completely effed up. The da. I heard a door open and shut. I looked up in time to catch the back of Jenna's head making a beeline out of my line of sight. Then I heard our front door slam. I breathed in and noticed a strange smell hung in the air. The smell that hovers after a packed, dirty fridge is opened. Drip, drip, drip. I ignored the smell, ignored the distracting drip and read the attached document. Then, my blood thoroughly chilled. I read it again. Here's the condensed version. The Nephilim, cast out of heaven and banished from earth, were forced to live out eternity in the pit. Beneath heaven, beneath earth, beneath hell, the great abyss, where primeval beings still lie, motionless and sedated, in a slumber spanning millennia. They are ancient, these beings. Older than man, older than the earth, older than the stars and all the cosmos, older than angels, older than demons, even, some say, Older than God himself. The angels and the demons all fear the destroyer. Satan fears the destroyer. So long as the destroyer sleeps, men have dominion over the earth and God over the heavens. And the fair ones, in perpetual servitude, reside in the abyss with him. They sing the destroyer to sleep. The fair ones must remain where they are, no matter how they protest. And they will protest. They will attempt escape from their prison by all means and at any cost. They desire to live on earth once more. To live amongst man and beast, though it is said they no longer know how. They will escape to this realm through places where the walls are thin. These places must be found, be mapped, be guarded. The doors must be locked with black obsidian. The doors will be determined by the evil radiating from them. They will be known amongst inhabitants as places where humans are not welcome where evil spirits hide. They come in sets of five. If a door has been opened, it must be closed and locked, because the fair ones must remain in the pit. They must sing the destroyer to sleep. When the destroyer awakes, the final war will begin. The final war will not be a fight between the forces of light and darkness. It will be all against him. All will join together. The angels and the demons, the blessed and the damned, the dead and the living. And all will be defeated. Shit. The doors must be locked with black obsidian. I eyed the stone triangle. Bury it deep, she had said. You know where. I knew where. Near midnight. I started walking. Black stone triangle in my purse. Newly purchased shovel slung over my shoulder. 
I came to the meshed, graffitied fence that surrounded the pit. I sized it up. I recalled my inclination, weeks before, to climb the chain links and throw myself into the deep hole, into the void. The door of the fair people, their way back into our world, the escape hatch from their prison. Ten years ago, Blacklight discovered the door and sealed it. For a decade, the five black stones they'd buried remained untouched. Until this lot was sold. Until the construction crew dug deep into the earth, creating the pit and dislodging the little object I was now tasked to replace. I now understood why the skeletal figures I'd seen, the figures I'd mistaken for homeless men, were digging so desperately in the empty lot across from the Werner building. There was another black obsidian triangle buried there. If they uncovered it, they could free their friends. I found the gate the construction workers had been using. The cheap chain and padlock was child's play. Two minutes with a bobby pin and it popped open. The construction site was silent. I was relieved to see a concrete mixing truck. Its huge barrel body pointed towards the pit. I looked down. Some concrete had already been laid at the base and thick metal grids lined the edges. If I could get to the bottom, make my way to the portion of the floor still hard dirt, I could bury the black obsidian there. Within hours, it would be entombed under a layer of cement. In retrospect, what I did next was practically suicidal. I had no idea how strong the metal grids were. For all I knew, they could have collapsed under my weight and sent me tumbling to my death. I hadn't thought to bring a flashlight and the ambient light from street lamps and stars left me operating under something like a gray filter. Luck was on my side that night, though, and I climbed safely to the bottom of the pit. It wasn't until I looked up that I fully comprehended just how far down I'd gone. I retrieved my shovel and jammed it, hard, into the dusty earth. Twenty minutes later, my dainty hands were calloused, my sweater discarded, and my t-shirt soaked in sweat. I made a mental note to start hitting the gym, and surveyed, somewhat proudly, the two or so foot deep hole I'd dug. As I wondered whether or not it was sufficient, I caught sight of movement out of the corner of my eye. My head shot up. To my left, there was something poking out of the dirt wall not yet covered by the metal grid. Four pale hands, fingerless, slab-like, braced themselves. Attached to long, bony appendages, broken by two hinge-like joints each, four wrists, four elbows, which bent at opposite angles. The lanky appendages extended, like the wings of a butterfly, from a featureless trunk, white, coated in a layer of glistening slime. Two on each side of an egg-shaped protuberance, facing upwards on a neck bend at a right angle. With what I will call, for lack of a better word, a face. A face. White folds of skin, wrinkled like a raisin. Moist, thick droplets sliding to the dirt floor. A hole, wide open, as though soundlessly screaming. And two huge, smooth, protruding spheres. Empty, milky white orbs. Eyes. I froze. My brain stalling at all this new information it was forced to process. There was a squelch, then a pop, and the thing dropped to the ground like a cockroach. It had no lower body. It had no legs. Just hundreds of long, fragile, gelatinous tentacles hanging flaccid, like streamers from a circular fissure in the dirt wall. I regained control of my vocal cords, and I screamed. I screamed as the thing, with a series of sounds similar to squashed bubble wrap, extended its four long limbs, as two of them, like plastic in a microwave, folded in on themselves and fused with its trunk. As tentacles melted, combined, knitted themselves together, and molded into two cylindrical rods, legs. As the thing steadied itself on its two upper extremities, on the slabs that now contain five webbed, but distinct, appendages and, wobbling, put its weight on its pair of flat, clay-like, freshly grown feet. It stood, white and naked, rocking on its new legs. I saw it changing, features taking form on its chest the wrinkles of its face flattening, then protruding into the beginnings of a nose. It closed its orb-like eyes, and when they reopened, they were black. They shrunk. Circles of brown and white appeared, and I was staring into eyes that were both human and other. The thing, the Nephilim, took a step forwards, 
I braced myself. I held up my shovel, ready to beat it back into jelly. The Nephilim crouched like a gorilla. On all fours, head twisted upwards, and ran at me. I adjusted my grip on the shovel. I swung. I hit nothing. There was a small cascade of dislodged dirt. I whirled around in time to see the Nephilim, with surprising grace, ascend the metal grid and climb out onto the surface. Rhythmic footfall. Then the clang of something heavy colliding with the fence. The jingling of chain link and then a faint thud. I left the shovel at the bottom of the pit, then regretted it the second I stepped back through the gate. I didn't know how far the Nephilim had gone or where it may have hidden, and a weapon would have made me feel a bit safer. But nothing attacked me from the shadows, and I returned to my apartment in peace, seized by unexpected waves of giddiness. I'd done it. I'd buried the obsidian triangle. I'd locked the door. I felt triumphant. Then I remembered the wrinkled, dripping face, the flaccid tentacles, and the slab-like hands, and I felt nausea bubbling in the back of my throat. If only that were the worst of it. If only the image of the naked, half-human abomination in the grey half-light were the only thing haunting my dreams. I could have forgotten. I could have learned to live with it, learned to sleep without the wine and the pills. But I will never be able to erase what I saw next. I was through my apartment door and halfway across the living room when I heard something rustle in the kitchen. I turned. It wasn't Jenna. It wore Jenna's clothes, her baggy jeans and black sweatshirt. Its hair hung like Jenna's did, wavy and auburn in shoulder length. It had two arms and two legs. It had a face. But that face was not my roommate's. The eyes were too beady. The pupils too large. The nose bulged like a mutated mushroom. The mouth gaped like a violent gash, revealing dog's teeth dripping the blood of the half-eaten squirrel discarded on the counter. With one graceful leap, Jenna, the thing posing as Jenna, flew across the counter and landed, on all fours, between me and the door. It bent its head upwards as though its neck were made of rubber. And it spoke. Don't be scared, Amelia. That voice. It was half a buzz, half piping, with a trill like electronic interference. It could not have come from a human mouth. It could not have been produced by human vocal cords. I screamed. I ran for the first door I saw. Jenna's room and slammed and locked it behind me. Slam. The Nephilim threw itself against the door. I took in my surroundings. Jenna's room was a mess. Her clothes had been pulled from her closet and tossed around like confetti, mixed with bits of foam from her eviscerated mattress. In one corner was a pile of torn strips of fabric and foam and chewed on bits of newspaper. A horrible smell hung in the air. Feces and rot. Slam. Go away. I screamed. I can be your friend, Amelia. I sobbed, imagining those words coming out of that twisted mockery of a face. That nerve-shattering, child's imitation of my roommate's voice. I want to stay here with you. Amelia. I can be her replacement. In my quaking, tear-drenched frenzy. I remembered something Jenna had told me once. Breathing through my mouth, forcing from my consciousness what could be down there. I reached under Jenna's bed. My fingers brushed metal. I pulled out Jenna's baseball bat. Slam. The hinges rattled. I ran to the window, cursing my own stupidity for dropping my purse, which contained my cell phone on the living room floor. I doubted I could safely jump from the second story. But maybe I would see someone down there. Maybe I could call for help. I hoisted the window open. I stared out into the little alleyway that branched off our street. Help me. I screamed. Drip, drip, drip. A droplet landed on my hand. A red droplet. I looked up. Up at the fire escape. The useless old fire escape I had seen the night of the earthquake. And I screamed. And I screamed, and I screamed, until the world spiraled into blackness. That night, the police received several calls from the apartment complex next to the Werner building. Twelve individuals reported hearing a woman scream for help. An elderly married couple stated they, through an open window, had seen one woman violently attacking another with a baseball bat. And one witness, 
A teenaged boy swore up and down he had watched a person leap out that window, land on the asphalt, pick itself up, and flee with the grace of a jackrabbit. The police found me huddled in the corner of Jenna's room, rocking and sobbing, covered in dirt and sweat and an implacable sticky black substance. They said I didn't speak. Then I simply pointed towards the open window. An officer followed my outstretched finger, looked out and up, gagged, vomited all over the carpet, then got on his radio and demanded immediate backup. Two hours later, I'd been carted off to the station, and the decomposing corpse of Jenna Morno was retrieved from the lowest platform of the fire escape. Her throat had been violently torn out, as though by a large animal, and she'd lay there, dead, for roughly three days. I was interviewed more than once, but never considered a suspect. I told them some story about an intruder who either found or stole Jenna's apartment keys, who I suspected had been sleeping in her room and holing up in our apartment when I wasn't around. I described this intruder as having Jenna's height and build. They said they believed me, but never found this mysterious woman. Some connections were made between Jenna's murder and the murders ten years ago. The animalistic mid-city mauler never identified and never caught. In particular, comparisons were drawn to poor Grace Jimenez. Like Grace, Jenna's body had been found somewhere no individual should have been able to wander. The fire escape was only accessible via the roof. The only door to the roof was locked, and the only person with the key to that door was 50 miles away with an alibi. I remembered the Nephilim in the pit. I remembered how skillfully it had climbed. There were a few reports in the area of missing dogs, of feral cats found with their stomachs torn open, of mutilated small mammals. But there were no more human deaths. And soon, everyone had moved on from Jenna's. My landlord, probably out of pity, let me move into a studio upstairs. I don't go out at night anymore. They poured a whole load of concrete into the pit the day Jenna's body was found, ensuring that the thing I buried remains that way. But I don't know what became of the fair people who'd already broken through. My boss gave me two weeks off work, plenty of time to think. I drove back out to Wyatt, once. But Blacklight had already packed up and left, again, in the dead of night. There are no new additions to the Reddit threat. I thought they'd come back to Koreatown. I recalled what the receptionist said to me about the Black Obsidian Triangle. It will slow them, but nothing can stop him. I took that to mean what I did was a temporary fix. That Blacklight would return to finish the job, permanently. That they'd stop it all like they had ten years ago. It's been months since Jenna's death, and I'm still waiting. Since then, there's been four more earthquakes, each slightly stronger than the one before. The latest was a 6.1. I was in my room when I felt the building shake. And, it might have been my traumatized imagination, but I know I heard, from somewhere far away, a low, inhuman growl. I could feel it in my bones. Then I remembered the other part of what the receptionist had said, sitting beside me in my car. Rats flee a sinking ship. The Nephilim, I believe, mean us no harm. The one in the pit could have attacked me, but didn't. The one who murdered Jenna did so not out of hatefulness, but out of jealousy. She wanted to be Jenna, to be human. They're not invading, they're fleeing. Adrian mailed the little black book back to me. I page through it, sometimes, and I get stuck on the last illustration, one that I had not previously noticed. It's of a figure, sitting atop a horrendous horse with gnarled horns and an eyeless face, wide open mouth lined with rows of teeth. The figure itself, the rider is only a silhouette. A black thing, clutching a long sword, flanked on all sides by an army of shadows. The only features shown are his round, white, pupil-less eyes. When the destroyer awakes, the final war will begin. Not if, when, 